happen today. Um, so I just started recording. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Veronica Young. Um, I am a program manager here at Code for America on the network team. I use the pronoun she, her. Um, and we're really excited today to have everybody. Um, most of the session will be led by my colleagues, David Crawford and Matt Bernius on the criminal justice team here at Code for America. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a minute. I just wanted to jump in with a little bit of kind of contexting of how we got here today um, and why we're really excited um, for this opportunity. Um, so many of you are part or active members of the Code for America network and um, in your um, local volunteer chapters across the country, um, there are 80 plus volunteer chapters um, in the United States um, that are part of the Code for America network. Um, and um, earlier this year, we went through a process of um, really honing down on kind of four priority action areas that we wanted to work on this year. Um, and this process was executed by working um, with folks in the community through workshops and through gathering feedback through surveys and a lot of care and attention from the National Advisory Council, really looking to kind of lift up the spirit of the network and where we wanted to put our energies. Um, and one of the areas that we, we decided to focus on was creating pathways to record clearance as an area to focus in. Um, and so this, um, there's been a ton of work in the criminal justice space in the network, um, as well as the criminal justice being um, a main pillar of the work that um, Code for America staff work on um, at Code for America as well. Um, and there have been so far lots of great ways to kind of intersect um, the work that's happening at the local level and then um, some of the work that's happening um, at Code for America HQ. Um, and so um, some of this in the past has been um, a group last year that did research into fines and fees. Um, last year's National Day of Civic Hacking, where we focused on the expungement process, um, and then lots of really great projects um, throughout the network. Um, and so we started kind of a process of talking with some folks that have been active in the record clearance space. Um, you might be familiar with the Clean Slate channel on Slack. Um, want to give a big shout out to some of the folks that um, have joined um, some of the calls that we had as we were kind of discussing this idea. Um, so Michelle and Jordan and Jacob and Jeremy and Sean, um, thank you all for um, your time and participation um, in being part of this kind of group that had this idea of how do we support um, brigades that are working on record clearance projects across the country. Um, and so um, a huge thank you to David and Matt um, and the folks on the criminal justice team that kind of stepped up and said, hey, well, why don't we create like a shared space for learning and talk about our experiences um, and give some perspective from our work from um, the criminal justice team here um, and also create an opportunity for brigade leaders and members to share their experiences as well. So that's why we're here. I'm excited to dive in. Um, if you have any questions, um, please make sure to put them in the Q&A box. This is the best way for us to be able to track questions. Um, and we'll have some dedicated opportunities to actually go through these questions as well. Um, other than that, you can feel free to chat one of us. Um, I will be kind of on standby to help on the operational side of things. So um, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, and we can go ahead and get started. All right, David, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, we just wanted to make a quick content note before we get started on this. Um, just to make sure, uh, you know, it's it should be self evident that this presentation is talking about the criminal legal system, but we are going to focus um, on parts that, you know, demonstrate the disparate and oppressive impacts that system has for black people, indigenous people, people of color. Um, we're also going to mention the, um, how difficult it is to have lived experience of a record. Um, and finally, when we're talking about different legal categories uh, that convictions fall into, uh, there are references to um, categories that include violence. 
So um, is Veronica teed us up? Uh, this is the first of a two-part series on creating pathways to record clearance. And today we're going to focus on understanding record clearance through um, the policy lens. Uh, so I'm David Crawford. I'm a program manager at Clear My Record, or sorry, at Code for America on the Clear My Record team. And my pronouns are he, him. And I'm Matt Bernius. I am a design researcher, principal design researcher on the team, and my pronouns are he, him as well. Um, as far as what we're covering today, uh, really what we're going to try and focus on is providing some overall training and discussion of the criminal legal system. Uh, talk uh, particularly about the policy side about it. So how does the state determine who's eligible what exactly does a record mean? And um, looking even at how the, the processes work. And then uh, for our next part, uh, where we'll hopefully be joined by a few other folks from the team, we're gonna really try to look at more of um, the specific sort of um, human-centered design aspects and opportunities for intervention within the system. Uh, and additionally, we're going to be doing some follow-up office hours next month where we'll, um, where you'll get a chance to meet with us and some of our other colleagues to discuss and kind of ideate on some of the ideas we, that you'll be hearing over these next two weeks. Oh, and also the, uh, the slide deck will be made available afterwards, most likely in the form of a PDF. Yep. Um, before we get started, we wanted to go over some of the uh, learning goals just to try to set expectations. Um, as Veronica mentioned, there's a lot of brigade members who've done amazing work already on record clearance, but we want to make sure that this is um, something that's accessible to people who haven't even done record clearance at all, but they're curious about it. So we structured this, uh, this particular workshop, part one, um, to have a few different outcomes in mind. So one, we want you to leave with a high level overview of the uh, criminal justice, sorry, criminal legal system, uh, especially at the state and local levels. Um, we wanna have people understand how mass incarceration is a central policy in this system, its scale and its impact on people um, and its connection to why there are so many criminal records. Um, we want people to understand what a criminal record actually is. It's a lot more complicated than it sounds. And um, how criminal conviction information, it lives in different systems and agencies across the state and counties. We also want everyone to have a good understanding of how the law determines who's eligible for record clearance. And we want everyone to leave with an understanding of the petition process, how a petition actually works its way through the legal system. Um, which again, it's, it's, there's a lot more to it than you might think. So to that, uh, we are going to rapidly move through introductions. In fact, I think uh, we'll probably just move right through the next slide since we've already introduced ourselves and dive right into that high level overview of the criminal legal system. We'll also cover a bit, as David was mentioning about the rise of mass incarceration, spend a, a bit of time on criminal records 101 to really center on that. And then the back half is going to be a combination of um, more of this discussion, but also some exercises. So our goal is to kind of walk you through how we calculate and understand eligibility through statute and then give you a chance to practice that very quickly on your own. Uh, and then the same thing with the actual record clearing process. So we're just going to skip through that. You know who we are. Let's get to the good stuff. Um, really quickly, the one thing we did want to talk a little bit about is just some of the work that we're doing within um, within the Clear My Record team and the criminal legal system uh, team here at Code for America. So really, it began with the launch of Clear My Record uh, and with clearmyrecord.org, which was a tool to essentially uh, help people move through an intake tool, that petition process that you'll hear us talking a lot about. And so that was really our first step in this. Uh, the goal was to connect pro se users or users who uh, were going to file for themselves with legal aid to um, navigate California's record clearance process. We learned a lot about the petition process in doing that, but we also learned its limits and its limitations. 
uh, some of the other work that we're doing around the petition process where that's still necessary is the work we're doing in Cook County, Illinois with um, uh, Cabrini Green, that's where Chicago is located. And again, that's helping us understand the system better. That work then translates into a lot of our current focus on automating record clearing processes at the state level and trying to, where possible, move away from the petition process towards just simply as soon as somebody has met a certain number of, um, of requirements, their record is automatically cleared. And we'll get it specifically in a bit into what that means. So with that, let's begin with a deep dive into uh, the criminal legal system. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to start, there's no such thing as the singular criminal legal system in the US. Um, in the most basic sense, there are at least 51 separate but interlocking criminal legal systems. Um, this is complicated and we're going to try our best to make it as uh, easy as we can to under, uh, explain. So for starters, there's a federal system, federal government's legal system. There's 50 state level systems. There's territorial systems. There's tribal systems and a military system. Each one of it has its own laws, organizational structures, jurisdictions, norms, business processes, personnel who make arbitrary decisions, all kinds of things. Um, but as a person trying to, or navigating that, as somebody who's going through the criminal legal system, every single step of the way that has different implications. And it also has a lot of implications for how data lives or where data lives and how it gets transmitted between departments. Um, you know, some folks might be aware that you don't usually enter the criminal legal system through the state level, you enter through the county level. Um, and since the county level uh, courts uh, and jails are so important to the way this is all structured, you could even say that there's more than 3000 criminal legal systems in the US since there's more than 3000 counties or county equivalent jurisdictions. Um, briefly, we're going to go through some, and name some of these agencies and system actors, um, and then I'll give, you know, kind of a, a very, very quick summary of what they do and how, how it all fits together. So um, at the city or municipal level, uh, the most common people that you'll encounter as uh, representatives of the system are, of course, police and arresting agencies. And so we'll police, uh, in the bare minimum sense of what police do, <laughs> They um, are people that patrol the uh, neighborhoods, they invest, they take reports of crimes, they investigate crimes, and the, the function that they serve in the technical sense is that they arrest people for crimes. Um, there's also municipal courts. Uh, these are usually used for violations and infractions. So if you imagine, you know, tickets and things like that, um, occasionally they involve misdemeanors but usually not anything that would involve uh, jail time as a sentence. Um, so usually just things that involve uh, fines. Uh, you know, municipal systems uh, ladder up to the county level system and say you do get arrested for something that has the, op or the chance of a jail sentence. You're gonna be handed off to the sheriff and the jail, uh, sheriff's department in the jail, uh, usually for pretrial detention. Um, and that's where you're held in captivity until a judge makes a decision whether you can be let out or not. There's also superior courts, which are sometimes called other things, and then superior court judges and court clerks. And this is like one of the big places where criminal justice data starts off. Um, there's also district attorneys and prosecutors. Uh, district attorney leads the prosecutorial office for a county. Uh, they, get, they have an enormous amount of power uh, in outcomes in the criminal legal system. District attorneys essentially decide whether somebody who's been arrested for a crime gets uh, charged with that crime or not, or charged with, yeah, it proceeds to a trial or not. Um, they can in, like recommend sentences for plea deals and try to stack the thing against you to make sure that you don't get a trial. There's a lot of power in there. And that's one of the reasons you see um, this rise of the so-called progressive prosecutor movement in the last few years. Also at the county level, we have public defenders who um, their role is to help indigent defendants, uh, people who don't have resources to hire their own attorneys. 
um, and they're usually heroes, but completely overworked and under-resourced. Um, also at the county level, you have probation, which is um, usually what's assigned to misdemeanor violations, or mis sorry, misdemeanor convictions if they don't have jail time attached to it. It's a form of supervision where you have to meet certain requirements to get off of it. Um, state level law enforcement, you, you usually have the state police, sometimes they're called state troopers or highway patrol. They're important for this because um, they often serve as the central repository of all data. Data flows up to the state police in a lot of cases. Um, you also have at the state level in terms of law enforcement, the attorney general and the department of justice, they serve essentially like a statewide district attorney um, role. It'd be like an easy way to uh, think about it. They also represent the state in cases and lawsuits and things like that. You have state level corrections. So if you know you have jails at the county level, you have prisons at the state level, and those are administered usually by what's called the Department of Corrections, and then individual prisons are administered by wardens and correctional officers. Um, also at the state level, you have a board of parole and parole officers. Parole is uh, essentially if you serve a certain amount of a prison sentence, certain cases you have opportunities to serve the remainder of that sentence outside of prison on parole. Uh, parole's been pretty restricted over the last 50 years or so, but um, there are movements to try to reform that. Um, in terms of state level courts, um, they're not as directly in, uh, related to the criminal legal system as everything we've talked about so far, but you know they're worth mentioning. There's appellate courts that ladder up from this, the county level superior courts. There's states have Supreme Courts and they also have administrative offices of the courts, uh, which set, uh, which are important because they set procedures and uh, various business practices, including data for the whole uh, court system of the state. And then on the federal level, uh, we're not gonna spend too much time focusing on the federal level for this presentation, just because so much of what so many people go through has to take uh, or takes place at the county and state level. And those are the really the most relevant things for setting up a pathway to record clearance. But it's worth mentioning that the FBI's federal law enforcement agency, there's also a federal attorney general and a federal department of justice. And there are also federal courts like the uh, circuit courts and um, the Supreme Court and district courts. Um, the federal, uh, sorry, the FBI is involved uh, in criminal record clearance and Matt will touch on this a little bit later. So, but as we said, there, these are all considered different types of systems and different levels, but they are, the way they connect is the important part um, of what we're hoping we take away from this. And it's really important when it comes to um, understanding what exactly is a record and what can we do about it. In terms of how they all fit together, this is, believe it or not, a vastly oversimplified um, process flow about how a typical criminal case would move through the system. Uh, I think some problems with it might jump out immediately that it, you know, it's devoid of ideology, for example. It's uh, assuming that everybody who ends up in the system has committed some type of crime. Uh, you know, you can be arrested on suspicion of things and not have committed anything. Um, you can get charged of things and, uh, for example, and not have been guilty of them. There's, there's a lot of arbitrary decision making, which is sort of represented in this and sort of not. But you can see um, there are stages to the way a criminal case moves through the system and how it jumps up to different levels of the system. So you have the municipal entry into the system and the county level uh, jail. You have county level prosecutors and pretrial things. You have usually your trial at the county level court, which is here represented as adjudication. And then depending on what type of case it is, if it's a misdemeanor, if it's a felony, you can end up with different levels of sanctions and sentencing, whether that's prison, jail time, or other uh, non-incarcerative um, sentences for uh, criminal offenses. We need to talk about mass incarceration. Um, you know, I've been trying to so far explain how the legal system works and all these things fit together, but none of this makes sense if you don't understand the way uh, it has all operated in the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, so 
mass incarceration at its most basic level talks about a policy shift beginning around 1970 and really taking off in the 80s and 90s where incarceration was the primary operating system here like all tough on crime policies led people into being warehoused and this became like the default way that uh, so-called criminal justice was administered in the country so this first chart uh, visualizes the way that sorry it visualizes the like sheer population in terms of u.s state and federal prisons um, between 1925 and 2014 um, so you can really just see the explosion between 1970 and um, 2014, which is the last year that the data was available in this chart. Um, it's not just the sheer number of population too. There's also um, on the next slide, there's, uh, it's, the, it's the rate of people too. There's, um, you know, sometimes if you just have a population number, it can look one way, but the rate of incarceration tracks exactly with it. So this is the incarceration rate over time based on the um, every 100,000 adults in the US. And you can see just like the, you know, the sheer population numbers, the rate um, shoots up as well during the same time period. The, um, both of these things, the sheer number of people and the rate make the US a global outlier. We're really out on a limb on our own in terms of using incarceration this way. Um, it's really, you know, it's hard to get that perspective without looking around the world and looking at the way that other criminal legal systems operate. So about one out of five, every single of people, all incarcerated people across the world are incarcerated in the US, although the US is only about 5% of the world's population. Um, so if you're thinking about rate or just sheer numbers, you know, China has approximately uh, three times the population of the US, but, you know, around half the number of prisoners. Um, so like this really is a uniquely US approach, like just incarcerating, incarcerating, incarcerating as a solution to um, public safety and crime issues. Um, In terms of how this works in the United States, we talked about the system, actors, and agencies, but let's talk about the number of people that are actually caught up in these things. This is a great uh, visualization from a group called the Prison Policy Initiative. They put out a report every year called The Whole Pie. Uh, there'll be a link to it. You can see a link down at the bottom, but there'll also be one in the deck. Um, more than half of people who are incarcerated, meaning they're like physically confined under control of the government, um, are incarcerated in state prisons. Um, so this is why we said earlier that it's so important for record clearance and just understanding the system that the state has the most important role here. Um, you can see that different types or categories of uh, criminal convictions make up different portions of the state population. Um, you can also see federal uh, prisons and jails and um, how much of a role drugs play in that, for example. Um, it's also in this tiny sliver, you can see, uh, you know, young people, children who are incarcerated, uh, people who are incarcerated in uh, the various territories of the U.S. You can see people in immigrant detention, such as ICE camps, um, and involuntary commitment, which a lot of people don't think about when they think in terms of incarceration. These are people um, under the system who have mental health issues that are being incarcerated involuntarily. We wanted to also zoom in a little bit on jails because um, so much of what we talk about is going to be focused on prisons, but it's really important to understand jails as well. Um, jails serve as the front door to, this, uh, to mass incarceration. Um, it's, uh, you know, it looks in the whole pie chart that this is a smaller section of prisons, but I believe, um, let me pull up the number here. I think there's uh, roughly 750,000 people in jail at any particular day in the US um, versus the state prisons population, but about 600,000 people enter prison every year in the US but over 10.6 million people cycle through a jail. 
So uh, while the population on any given day um, looks smaller than jail, or sorry, looks smaller than prison, it's important to know that like more than 10 people end up in jail for a certain amount of time uh, every year. And another important thing to know about that is that most of these people are not convicted of a crime. Uh, jail can be a sentence for certain misdemeanors, but most people are awaiting their trials. They're awaiting to find out whether they can get bail or maybe they've been offered bail and they just can't afford it. Finally, uh, when you're talking about mass incarceration and just the number of people who are caught up in this system, it's important to realize that it's not just literally being captive in a state facility. Uh, we also have to talk about correctional control. So, you know, we have a, uh, 7 million people. Um, oh, sorry. Um, we have about 7 million people total who are under probation, parole, or correctional facilities themselves. So this is also a much bigger problem than just jail or just prison or just the federal government. Um, when you look at break these things out, um, you can really start to see like just the number, the, the scale of how this impacts people and the ripple effects that it has. And these aren't things that end when um, correction ends. You know, when you have when you leave probation or you leave parole or you leave incarceration, it's not like these things just simply end. Um, so you know, we have an incarcerated population. We have people. We have um, more than twice that amount who have been incarcerated before. You have almost 20 million people who have ever been convicted of a felony. You have almost 77 million people with a criminal record, which is actually a very low estimate. There's also a rec uh, uh, older estimate um, that's still relevant that has about has it at about 100 million people, which you know over time that tracks to about one out of every three people in the country. And then of course, these people have, everyone has family members, so. Um, at least 113 million people have a family member who has been incarcerated before. It's also worth talking, or it's also incredibly important to mention that these things don't just apply equally across the board. You know, the system has devastating effects for millions of people, but those effects are magnified, particularly for black people and brown people. Uh, it's probably, it's becoming more well known about policing, especially after the uprisings this summer, that modern policing itself has roots in what are, used to be called slave patrols and in union busting. Um, we don't have to go into too much of what those things were, but it was, there's ripple effects based into the way policing is conducted nowadays in terms of, you know, policing the boundaries of race or policing the boundaries of class. So, um, when you have, those were, you know, antebellum pre-Civil War and industrial era approaches to policing. When the Civil War was settled and the 13th Amendment was adopted, um, it theoretically abolished slavery, um, chattel slavery as being property and forced labor for people unless they were convicted of a crime. And it, it specifically says that in the 13th Amendment. So, as millions of black people became free through the 13th Amendment, the country and the criminal legal systems exploded in response by creating racialized incarceration. Um, these things were under the guise of law enforcement and public safety by drumming up sensationalist and racist campaigns to make everyone um, fear free black people. So this is a picture of a chain gang, which was a really common way of re-enslaving people and making them do labor for the state. Um, and this exploded immediately after um, slavery was theoretically abolished. There's a great documentary about this um, called The 13th on Netflix uh, by Ava DuVernay. We highly recommend that as a starting place to learn more about this issue. Um, so, you know, you have the situation where the criminal legal system is replacing slavery in a lot of ways. And the, ra the rise of mass incarceration over the past half century has continued this. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can look at this. Um, specific policies as part of the tough on crime ideology. Um, you have things like the war on drugs, disproportionate sentencing, 
three strikes laws, mandatory minimums, stop and frisk, the school to prison pipeline, and so many other things that we call tough on crime. These are ways that structural racism has become embedded throughout the legal system. Um, on the previous slide, there's a uh, chart that shows um, the disparity between you know, reported drug use between white people and black people. It's approximately the same you know, in the last month. One out of 10 people has used some type of drug. But if you actually look at arrest rates, it's insane. You know, almost three times as many people are being, uh, almost three times as many black people are being arrested for drugs as um, white people, even though the rates of use are the same. And there's a great book um, called The New Jim Crow by Professor Michelle Alexander that goes into a lot of detail about this particular phenomenon. Um, and these, you know, the, the simplest way you can see this reflected in population or incarcerated population numbers. Uh, black folks make up about 13% of the folk or of the people in the United States and about 39% or sorry, about 40% um, of the people who are incarcerated. Meanwhile, white folks make up about two thirds of the people in the United States, but only about 39% of the people incarcerated. And the critical thing to understand about all of this is, especially when we begin to talk about the concept of a criminal record, your involvement with the criminal legal system doesn't stop at the end of incarceration. And in fact, as we understand, uh, the, having a record, even before we get into the monitoring that, uh, or go beyond the monitoring that folks have after they leave, uh, leave prison and are still under state uh, supervision, but beyond that, you'll see that the record just burdens people long after their official sentences end and really prevent them from moving on with their lives. Um, so again, as we discussed, the key bar here is that 77 million people who have a criminal record within the United States. Uh, and to give you a sense of um, the size and scope of this problem, uh, currently, there is approximately uh, 2,300,000 people who are currently incarcerated and confined. If we zoom out a level and think to what David was saying about the amount of people under correctional control, you're seeing a larger bubble of approximately 7 million people. And again, these are individuals who do have to do things like regular check-ins with, um, with parole officers, things along those lines. And in fact, um, when we talked about some, uh, the amount of people who are in jail, not necessarily on convictions, a technical violation or failing to show up or meet all of the, the conditions of that can quickly move you back into that incarcerated bubble. But then we get this, these 70 million people who have some type of criminal record. And to give you a sense of scale, let's just zoom out and get a real image of the proportion between each of those. Uh, and again, this is showing you the scope of uh, folks within the US who've been impacted by the system and whom the system continues to impact even after they've exited control. Uh, a recent interviewee that I spoke with just really put this so succinctly, the record was like a weight, like something around my neck. So what are we talk about when we talk about a record? Um, for as much as it sounds like it's a single document, it's really a collection of all of these different documents and data points that are held by different system actors. Uh, the primary one that most people think about are rap sheets, uh, which stands for record of arrest and prosecution. Uh, they're, often all, they're often in the modern system referred to as CCHRs or computerized criminal history reports. Those are the documents that are going to be held at the state level as well as um, by the FBI. But there are additionally things like court records, arresting agency records, so the police or wherever the, the arrest orig uh, originated, jail and prison files. So for example, in, mo in many states, uh, you can go onto a prison's website and see exactly who not just the current incarcerated population is there, but historical records going back decades, uh, prosecutor's records, probation records. These are not designed to be human readable documents. So what you see on the side there is a California rap sheet. Uh, and yet navigating these are going to be critical for getting through a petition based and uh, expungement process. 
These records include beyond personally identifiable information, information about arrests, charges, court appearances, dispositions. And when we say disposition in a legal uh, terminology, that simply means the outcome of a case. Um, and then ultimately sentencing outcomes. And the critical thing to understand is unlike points on a driver's license, items in a record never go away. We'll talk about how they may not always appear on a background check, but the reality is unless you're in a state that's passed clean slate legislation, the record is there until an individual takes action to attempt to seal or expunge part of it. Now, again, because we are a patchwork of criminal legal systems and each state has its own um, statutes, every state has different rules about public access to parts of the record. So in terms of computerized criminal history reports in some states like California, they can only be accessed by uh, select criminal justice agencies, some public employees and licensing agencies and the individual whose record it is. In other states like Colorado, you can go online and pull anybody's criminal history report. Uh, the other type of report, which is typically considered more or less a, a universally available public record or court records. So these are also typically the primary source for commu uh, commercial background checks and to they are often sold in bulk. So there are many states where you can just simply uh, as a company put down a certain amount of money and get a feed of all of the court records in the state. Uh, which is also what has led to the growth in um, commercial criminal background checks. And these are part of a larger series of background checks that include credit and employment checks. Um, commercial criminal background checks like the one you see here uh, are used in everything from hiring to licensing and that can be professional licensing. It can also be licensing for firearms if you're um, like trying to apply for a hunting license. Uh, housing and, and apartments, uh, volunteering at schools and churches, childcare, uh, security clearances, and personal finance. Now, when you think about background checks, there are typically two broad types of background checking agencies, uh, Fair Credit Report Act, FICRA compliant ones, and non-FICRA compliant ones. So an example of like a non-FICRA compliant agency are some of the sketchy background checks that you'll see popped up at like the top of a Yahoo page where it's like, provide some information we will and we'll be able to look up an individual. Typically, those are not the ones that are being used by an employment firm. Um, ones that are being used for actual employment typically have to comply with the rules of FICRA, which is uh, both state and federal legislation around reporting acts, which provides a way to actually resolve problems within a, um, within a background check. But regardless, the, mo the majority of these checks are made up of a mix of bulk data. So again, going out and we're going to just buy all the data from courts in a state, or uh, in many cases, the, the results of court runs where they actually literally send somebody, a court runner down to the state, uh, to the county court to try and pull your records and understand if you have anything listed there. Different checks, because the checks happen at different levels, they can look at different sections of a person's record. So this actually creates a lot of, um, of uh, confusion among folks who are getting their background checked. So sometimes if it's a, if it's a relatively um, light background check, they may only look at the past seven years for a more, uh, for a, a, a higher profile job or for another organization, they could be looking at your full background. And so if you have something on your record, you enter a state where you're never quite sure whether it's going to appear or not. And I wanna just kind of share the impact that that has on folks' lives. So people who ha are living with a criminal record often are completely destabilized by it. They never know when it's going to appear. So this is a great example of an individual who was working at a, at a um, secure, home security startup for over a year, performing great, and then they were acquired and suddenly everyone had to reapply for their own job. And because he had a, um, a uh, violent misdemeanor on his record, single, a single incident from years before, he was immediately let go with no attempt with no ability to explain his situation. And you think 
it might just be about convictions, but the reality is arrests follow as well. So another individual that I talked to recently talked about a single arrest. Uh, it, was, it was something that charges were almost immediately dropped on. She was never found guilty, but continued to follow her, her for her life for over a decade. So she wasn't initially allowed to volunteer at her daughter's school and had to go in front of a board to explain that this was a charge that was um, filed against her by an uh, vindictive individual and they didn't even show up in court on the day that she was arraigned and she was immediately released because of that. It prevent, she had to explain it when she became a notary and in fact, and this is incredibly common, when she applied to become an, uh, to get her insurance license, she was, automatically turned down because she had a single arrest on her record, not counting the fact that it didn't lead to a, con uh, that there was no conviction or anything else involved. This also creates huge psychological loads on the folks who are dealing with this. And so when you talk to these people, uh, people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, you'll often hear them just constantly in a state of worry that somebody even years afterwards and they've reestablished a life, we'll find out that they had a record and they're suddenly back in the system all over again. And so from that perspective, the record becomes just an extension of imprisonment, restricting people from being able to get, find apartments, to, to have stable, um, stable employment. And um, to really help you understand why this is so important, we just, constantly hear when we talk to folks, that folks with records are consistently the last hired and first fired uh, on jobs and those opportunities. So therefore, this is why record clearance is so important. Um, so in terms of record clearance, really quickly, um, as with all things in the criminal legal system, the meaning of record clearance changes from state to state. Uh, and you'll understand this a little bit more when we dive into statute, but there are a couple of variables for you to, to appreciate. Some states will talk about a term like expungement, some will use the term sealing, some will use non-disclosure. Even potentially more frustratingly, the way one state des defines expungement is different than the way another state defines expungement. So we prefer to kind of think about this as a continuum of relief. And on the most extreme side to the one side, there's a concept of like total destruction, which literally records are removed and destroyed. In some cases, uh, they are literally sent to the person who, who, uh, who they belong to. And it's up to them to, to do whatever they want with them, but they are no longer accessible in the system at all. On the other side, we have states where they have ver various forms of limited non-disclosure, which means the general public and select third parties cannot see a record. But if you're pulled over, uh, if anything happens, the an arresting agency system actors will be able to see exactly what you did. There's a wide range of things in the middle. In terms of some of the other variables, there's a difference between process. Is it a petition-based process versus automatic? What qualifies? So some states you're only able to um, clear arrests and non-convictions. Other ones will also include some municipal and traffic offenses. Some will include misdemeanors. Some states will include felonies, but even within there, there are things like different classes and levels of those. So to understand eligibility, that means diving into statutes. Great. Um, so we're approaching the first activity section in um, this workshop. We've been talking a lot, but we are going to quickly go through um, what we're talking about when we're talking about is something eligible to be expunged, dismissed, sealed, cleared. So the first uh, way we're going to do that is um, by looking at the statute itself. It's important to note that for eligibility, at least, it's always going to be detailed in a state statute. So for this activity, we're gonna be looking at Iowa's Penal Code section 901C3, which is um, fortunately for us and this exercise, uh, actually a pretty straightforward eligibility one. There's some pretty crazy ones out there. Um, 
we won't name names, but it's uh, pretty dense to get through some of these. Luckily, Iowa is straightforward, and that's what we'll be using today. Um, when you're going through statutes, um, it's, a, it's important to understand the way the criteria work. Uh, some of these things are for individual people's circumstances. Um, we like to call these person level or individual cr level criteria. And for example, this could be if somebody has pending charges against them. In many cases, that makes them ineligible to have their record cleared. But that's an individual person circumstance rather than um, anything having to do with the conviction itself. When you're talking about convictions themselves, most states allow some type of misdemeanors to be cleared and they'll usually be spelled out. They often exclude most felonies, especially violent crimes, but these are conviction level things. So it's about which types of convictions are eligible or ineligible. In terms of things that are ineligible, sometimes the disqualifications are listed, but sometimes only the eligible criteria are listed. So you have to be able to think and look between the lines to make sure like, oh, they're only listing this, but that actually means that they're not including this. And understanding eligibility is important, uh, not just in terms of like who can get their record cleared. It's also important by understanding like where is all this documentation living? You know, if you have fines and fees, where do I look to actually confirm that? You know, if you, if a waiting period, you can't clear your record until, you know, three years after you've left prison or jail, like, how do I confirm that? Um, you're going to have to look in different uh, places to be able to pull that documentation together. Um, so real quickly, we're going to go through some of the stuff to look out for when you're actually doing this parsing. Uh, we're going to start off with the non-conviction section of Iowa. And um, first of all, you're going to look for, sometimes it's spelled out this easily, which things uh, are actually covered in this section of the penal code. So here it says that not guilty verdicts and criminal charge dismissals. This is the expungement procedures for that, or the expungement eligibility for that. Um, Next, you'll look for the qualifying dispositions. And like Matt said earlier, disposition is, it's a legal term for like the outcome of a criminal case as it flowed through that process. Um, so here you'll see for a quote unquote non-conviction, a case where there wasn't a conviction, they want it to be an acquittal, meaning that you went to trial and you were proven non-guilty, um, or if the case was dismissed where the prosecutor drop the charges or the judge threw the case out. Next, there's a preconditions. Um, this is very similar to what we were talking about in terms of individual level criteria. This means the person themselves has to pay off all of the different fines and fees and meet all those uh, probation requirements. Um, or sorry, if it's a non-conviction, it's mostly court fees and things like that. But you can't get started on the rest of this uh, go, you can't, I'm getting ahead of myself, you can't get through the eligibility criteria if you don't meet these preconditions. Then we also have very common waiting periods. So for the non-conviction statute, um, it has 180 days have passed since that, that qualifying disposition took place. So if the case was thrown out um, six months ago, uh, You'll, it should be able to qualify, but not until then. And then next we have disqualifiers. Um, you'll see this a lot with uh, conviction expungement statutes, but it's also there for these non quote unquote non convictions. Um, there's going to be things that are specifically uh, Set, like specific bars and filters for eligibility. And these can be person level or they can be conviction level. Like sometimes you can see conviction type A, B, and C, misdemeanor type A, B, and C are not eligible. Or it could be, in this case, the person themselves was not found guilty by reason of insanity. And that has nothing to do with the conviction itself. That's a person level outcome disposition in the case. So 
So um, we're going to get started or give everyone some time to um, try this out on their own. But we wanted to give you a couple models of how this might work when you're trying to parse who is eligible and what convictions are eligible uh, for record clearance. So one way we do that on the Clear My Record team is by creating what we call an eligibility flow diagram. It's essentially a flow chart. And we start with the highest level things that will exclude the most amount of people from eligibility and then work our way down to the most specific types of things. So um, you'll see on the left, this is a generic example. It's not necessarily a specific state, but it has a lot in common with a lot of states. Um, and then so we have people or person level criteria shaded in gray. And you can see the logic of it, it flows down for every not eligible thing. And if a person or conviction is eligible, it'll flow to the right. A different way to do it, and um, a different way to do it could also just be all of the following must be true. And so this is a way that we prepared it for California's petition process. Um, for California, it must be you are not currently currently serving a sentence, you're not on probation, and you've completed all of the probation requirements, fines, fees, restitution. You do not have any charges pending against you. The con and then those are the people or the person level uh, eligibility criteria, and then you have your conviction level eligibility criteria. So the conviction did not have a sentencing requirement of time in state prison. The conviction was not a misdemeanor level sex offense against a minor or a felony level statutory sexual offense. Or the conviction happened at least one year ago, meaning if you were not sentenced to local jail or probation, at least one year has passed since that happened. So you can do it as a flow chart or you can do it as all of the following must be true. So we're gonna give everyone a few minutes to try this out. Um, they, uh, if we haven't done it already, we'll put uh, paste the link into the chat where you can pull up Iowa's um, expungement statute. Um, and then you will see that there's a misdemeanor section and the non-conviction section we just went through. Uh, we want everyone to take a few minutes to be able to like give it a shot. You can do it as a flow chart if you have some graphic design programs ready like Illustrator or Mural or you can even just do text boxes and PowerPoint or something or a pen and paper is fine too. But if uh, uh, wording is more your game, you can try yet yeah, um, all of the following must be true. Um, but iOS is pretty straightforward and we want to give everyone the chance to um, try it out. Oops. And then uh, we're going to put up back on the screen things to keep in mind while parsing the statute. One thing we want to uh, make clear though, is that we're not gonna have a lot of time to go through everybody's examples here. Um, we wanna just give everyone a little bit of heads down individual time to do this, but we think this is a good way to um, get folks to sign up for office hours if you wanna review how eligibility works. Um, it's not quite a homework assignment, but we wanna be able to get your creative juices flowing and then uh, work together in a smaller group situation to go through and figure out um, how to understand eligibility logic. Um, I think we'll give a few minutes to everybody for this. Uh, what are you thinking, Matt and Veronica, in terms of timing? Um, I maybe give folks, uh, I don't know, five to 10 minutes to, to start kind of working through this. Um, how do you think that fits with the rest of the schedule? I think five minutes would be great. And that'll preserve us a bit. Um, and we're monitoring the chat window. So if you see or you have questions about it, we can also uh, answer them there. Or if you want to raise your hand, we're happy to try and uh, give you a little bit of immediate feedback. After this, we're going to look at um, a different aspect of it and with another activity. And then following up on that, we're going to be doing Q&A at the end of the session.
Looks like Chanel has a question, so I will allow you to talk. Hey, Chanel, you should be able to talk now. Oh, I was actually just typing my question. I was um, going to ask if anybody here was familiar with the National Clean Slate Roundtable. I was just told about it, but I was also informed that it never kind of came to fruition. So I just was wondering, wondering about that because I'm definitely interested in being a part of that and keeping, you know, one everyone up to date on what's going on with the expungement policies um, and legislation here in Wisconsin that we're working on. Yeah, um, Chanel, if you don't mind typing that question in the chat and then um, David and, and Matt can follow up um, just so folks can um, focus kind of on the activity at hand. And I don't know if we have an immediate answer um, so they can look into, um, into that and then um, follow up with you um, individually. Does that work? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. As you're probably noticing while you're doing this, um, one of the things that it, you're going to have to get used to in doing this work is parsing legal text. And so one of the things that we always recommend, and you'll see me uh, bring it up as we go through the record clearance process, is trying to find really amazing partners um, to assist with that part of it. And so there are so many incredible legal aid groups uh, across the country that we always recommend kind of trying to bring them out and really, uh, I know like Code for Vermont and or Code for Burlington and other groups have been just doing some amazing work with local resources like that. I will tell you, we read these statutes on a pretty regular basis, David, neither David nor myself are lawyers. You can come up to speed on it, but occasionally you hit a state, I'm thinking about Texas, that just really you need to get professional help to make sure you get everything right. In our next workshop next week, um, we'll also be talking about some strategies to make those partnerships. So I'm thinking um, if anybody has any questions or um, thoughts about what you're seeing in the Iowa statute, we'd love to hear them or otherwise we can kind of press on and then talk about the second half of this, which is moving into the actual mapping of the petition-based processes. And we can definitely answer questions at the end as well. All right. Well, um, let's keep moving because uh, this will also help, I think, connect to the way that the um, the eligibility criteria then manifests itself also as a process, and so. David kind of showed you already the eligibility flows that we do to try and understand um, who is eligible for an expungement. The other critical thing about doing that is it helps open up some conversations about where there may be gray areas in the process or points where if you're interested in not only building but getting into advocacy work where you can advocate that if you were to shift were to shift a policy by a couple of years, it would have a great greater impact on a population. And probably one of the best examples of that is, for example, um, 
for folks with misdemeanors, a lot of uh, some states don't allow you to clear a misdemeanor until uh, 10 years have passed, which isn't helpful uh, in the respect that sometimes misdemeanors will not will begin to appear less frequently on background checks after seven years. So it's a point where you can have a conversation or try to advocate for saying, why don't we make it less than seven years so that way there can be a much broader impact on individuals' lives. The other piece of the work that we do is we try to create these process maps that visualize all the major steps that uh, key actors, and that's petitioners, courts, prosecutors, law enforcement, need to take in the petition process. So uh, for any of you who are familiar with service design, these are, these are more or less service blueprints. So process mapping is really, really important for a number of reasons. One thing is that process information can be really difficult to find. So whereas, uh, as David mentioned, statutes will always contain eligibility information, they don't always contain um, the full process. And in, in, in some cases, it'll simply say the specific process for applying for, a, for uh, record sealing shall be determined by the courts. So depending on the state, you're going to need to do some looking through the statute to understand how much of the, how much of the process is specifically articulated in the statute and how much of it do you need to look other places. Another reason why process mapping is so important is often steps are silent. And what we mean by silent is they're not actually stated in the statute. So either they're implied or again, in the case where, um, where uh, for example, there's nothing mentioned about getting a, uh, a computerized criminal history report in the statute, but it turns out that when you actually look at the petition-based forms, there's no way of filling them out without having that information on hand. And so this is again, why it's so important to um, reach out to legal aid societies or sealing packages and look at all of that material because often what you'll find out is that um, for a pro se litigant, somebody who's applying for themselves, it's almost impossible for them to get through the process because there are all of these silent steps that you need to be able to navigate. The other critical thing, and this is bridging a little bit into what we'll be discussing next week, but uh, process maps and also those eligibility flows are uh, really important research tools and living documents for us. So when we go and we meet with people, we share the process map with a legal aid society or with people within the government agencies, and we use them to get feedback to understand what things have been missed and also where there are opportunities to potentially change things or automate something. So again, we wanna take you through what this would look like. So I'm, I'm going to be um, quickly doing the sealing records after conviction, persons eligible, petitions, notice and hearing order for Nevada. So um, this is uh, Nevada state statute uh, 179.245. And Nevada is a case where a lot, but as we'll see, not all of the flow is articulated in the statutes. So in the same way that we parse and read the um, the, the, the eligibility information, we do the same thing with looking for certain terms within the statute. So for here, one of the first things that we're looking, looking for is they say right off the, the top that whatever petition needs to be accompanied by the verified records received from the Central Repository of Nevada's records of criminal history. So again, when we mentioned earlier on that um, where state police come into this, that is your computerized criminal history report from the Nevada State Police. So we create two actions here. Uh, the first one is for the petitioner, they need to get a copy of that, that history. And then a second one from public safety. In the next stage of the process, we look for if there are specific um, special additional documents that need to be included. So in this case, Nevada, uh, says that you have to include something called the Certificate of Acknowledgement. Um, and so that lets us know to drop it in there. Now, the reason why there's a space there is that we also notice this line right here, that they need to have uh, 
that information for all agencies of criminal justice that maintain such records, which means this is a sign that an individual needs to know everyone who may have their records. And so that's a case where we actually have to add in and think about um, adding in a list of other public agencies, um, companies, officials, or, or other custodians of records. That becomes a sign for us that in addition to getting that computerized uh, criminal history report, people are also going to need to go get their uh, current conviction history from public safety and or local police agencies just to make sure that, especially if there are arrest records or other pieces, they're included in that. Now, the other thing you'll see is we try to also take these phases together and, and bundle them up under these green arrows at the top in the way that we do it that just kind of allows us to talk about what phase of collection we're in. So this is what we would consider the gather documents phase. Um, as we continue on through the statute, the next major section is about actually submitting the packet and notification. So we'll see that uh, upon receiving a, a petition packet, the court shall notify the law enforcement agency that arrested the petitioner of the crime and the prosecuting attorney. So that tells us exactly that we need to, um, we need to show that the individual serves their packet to the court the court's going to receive the packet in the county uh, and the court clerk level, and also that they forward a packet to the DA. Uh, also in here is one of those great examples of an invisible step, which is that the statute never actually says that you have to complete and fill out a petition, but that's a really important human moment to include in that. So that's the type of thing that you learn to add into these process charts. One of the other things that's really important to understand and to look for is discretion. And as David was mentioning, prosecutorial discretion. In most counties and in most courts, if a prosecutor chooses not to, um, not to object to a clearance, there's a good chance the court will just allow it to go through. Not always the case. But in most places, the prosecutors have an option to object to it. So then it's trying to understand how does prosecutorial um, discretion fit in and how that can uh, trigger a hearing to actually have a judge review the petition and move forward that way. And finally, the other key piece of this is then looking at not only um, the judgment and hearing process, but then what happens when an individual receives relief, which means typically that a lot of information is going to have to go to a whole series of different agencies. So uh, not only to letting the petitioner know, but also letting the courts know that they need to remove the records, that the prosecutors need to remove or seal the records. It it's all depends what's in the statute. And also um, for the state record repository who may also then be passing it to the FBI. So this is what we attempt to do for each of the states that we, uh, we analyze. Now at this point, if we had a bit more time, I, we, the idea was to let you try this out again with uh, Delaware. Uh, and we're still gonna encourage you to do this and we're happy to review it at, during office hours. When you're looking at Delaware, I'm gonna give you just a couple hints. Um, pay attention to sections E and F of uh, statute four, th uh, 4,374, but also be aware that not all of the information is in the statute. And so this is where we often do a lot of Googling uh, and most of what you're going to be looking for to add in those extra steps will be at this uh, URL uh, in a useful PDF that the Delaware courts have put together. So with that, I think, David, how are you feeling about just using your, our remaining time to just have a discussion? That sounds good to me. I think before we do that, it's probably good to um, boost up the second workshop one more time. And then, yes. you know, the reminder about office hours, of course, but for the second workshop, we're hoping to have um, a lot more of a discussion about identifying a need for record clearance, like who has a need, obviously the person with the record but there's also people helping to prepare these petitions and a petition process flow that Matt's been walking through can help you surface those time or certain pain points where a tech 
product intervention actually could make this streamlined. Um, mm -hmm. There's other ways to identify those things, uh, making partnerships with other organizations, um, interviewing people. Uh, you know, we're also going to be talking about human centered design and understanding who's using this product and what do they need to get out of it. And we're going to review some of the, so the record clearance products that uh, the Clear My Record team at Code for America has made, but then also some from brigades as well. And everyone will talk about lessons that have happened um, in the discovery and generation and use of those products and how it informs our work going forward. So that isn't covered in this workshop, but we are going to be covering it in the second workshop. And I know this is a lot to take in, um, and this is difficult. Yeah. Um, it's difficult for us too. <laughs> so I don't want it to be an entire a huge barrier to entry. Um, these things are complicated, but we're uh, we're here to help. Yeah. To, to give a preview of that, if we go back to this slide for a sec, when I talked about that little draft motion box that wasn't officially in the statute, but it's a really necessary part. Uh, an example of a brigade. Kind of tackling a small challenge within that, but a really important one is, I believe it's code for Los Angeles, is right now working on something that can help somebody auto generate a form letter that's really important to include in that that talks about why you should have, why you should get this beyond the fact that you fit all the statutes. Here's these important things to say about how you have quote unquote turned your life around, which I can talk about how frustrating people find that statement, but it's often an important part of the process, unfortunately, right now. So Q&A, um, what can David and I answer about uh, expungements or criminal records or any other aspect of this process? Yes, and if folks um, either want to raise their hand, we can call on you um, to answer your question live, or you can put your um, questions into the Q&A box. Okay, let's start with Jesse. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, so, and I understand this, um, this invitation went out to a broad audience, um, but just as like a, a you know, regular citizen trying to get involved with this, to me, it seems like the first step would be to um, get in connection with like some type of legal aid society. Um, I, I really am struggling to understand um, like the point of entry for someone um, outside of, uh, you know, that type of organization. Yeah, so Jesse, I can start. Um, so um, I, I guess the first question is, are you involved with a local Code for America Brigade chapter in your community? Um, in Chicago, so I'm aware in Chicago, we have Code for Chicago, um, which is a rather recent um, brigade. Um, and there's also, it's not an official brigade, but um, there's uh, Shy Hack Night, which is um, like a civic uh, tech hacking organization. Um, they get together once a week and they work on several projects. Um, I've been involved with the Shy Hack Night in the past. Um, I've gone to a couple of meetings for Code for Chicago. Um, I'm not necessarily an active member of either one of those organizations right now. Okay. Great, um, that, that's helpful. Um, so I can let um, David and, and Matt chime in here, but just in terms of kind of some of the structural questions here, um, you know, um, a lot of the folks that are, are on this call are part of the brigade network and, um, you know, local brigade chapters um, usually will have kind of teams of folks that work on projects. And, um, and a lot of times, and we encourage and, and hopefully a lot of projects are done in partnership with partner organizations in the spaces that we're looking to um, work in. Um, so I think that your kind of initial question of 
um, is a legal aid um, society or organization a good place to start? Um, I think the answer would be yes. And also adding on to that, that having kind of a group of folks um, where you can kind of start that process of working together to reach out to a partner um, is really helpful as well so that um, you're not necessarily needing to do that on your own. Um, and a brigade structure or a similar sort of structure is a good um, place to kind of initially find um, some other folks that might be interested um, in engaging in those partnerships. And then I can let Matt and David answer the partnership question of, of who are um, good partners to reach out to. Yeah, I think that's important to realize um, about the brigade structure itself and then in terms of outreach to other organizations. Um, we're going to cover a lot of it next week if you're able to join. Um, and I think it's important, we, we can cover how we've done it. And I think it's important um, that brigades share information amongst themselves on how to do it, how to do that as well. Um, Veronica mentioned at the very beginning, there's a channel in the Code for America Slack called uh, it's a clean slate, clean hyphen slate. And a lot of, uh, well, yeah, the main brigades that have been uh, handling this and building products for so long um, can will have advice on how they've reached out to partners. I think, um, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Portland and Greater Boston Legal Cert, or Portland and Code for Boston um, both worked with legal aid uh, organizations in order to hone their products and figure out where exactly it makes sense to build something that will focus on addressing some kind of record clearance needs. So it's not like you're off on your own in the wilderness. How do I digest all of this stuff on my own and then figure out what to build? Um, I actually, yeah, I was wondering, oh, there's a question in the chat, but if anyone who's really active on the Clean Slate channel wants to like, um, give a shout out in the chat too, uh, or, you know, people can connect amongst themselves too. The, um, yeah, and, and one thing I, I want to stress is that's actually the way that we work uh, as well, is that any state that we're working in, any place we're working in, we are working to find typically a, a legal aid partner or someone else to assist with uh, our work. And even uh, beyond that, and I'm going to bridge this into the question that uh, Sean asked. In terms of trying to reach target audiences, um, another great place to look at are other community-based organizations who, who are working with, uh, with these communities. You can often start with talking, uh, many communities have uh, support groups for folks going through reentry. Uh, so, uh, folks who've been uh, formerly incarcerated re-entering the community. And what you'll discover is that there are often really extended support networks for, um, for people who've been impacted by the criminal justice system. Again, legal aid societies are a great place to, uh, to start as well. Probably one of the big challenges is you're trying to uh, work, think through that is uh, different people are at different stages, uh, depending on how recently they've been incarcerated or how long they've been living in the community. We also will um, use other tools for trying to recruit people, which can include things like Craigslist or, or other, um, other venues like that. Obviously, all of that is also incredibly difficult right now because of just working through COVID. Um, but ultimately, always the best way to get folks from the community is to get out and really spend time uh, within the community itself. Um, thank you for that. Um, Jesse, I hope that answered your, your question. And if you have a, any other questions, feel free to put it in the chat um, or raise your hand again. Um, also to um, Sean's question around reaching target audiences, I think that's one of the, um, another, you know, 
benefit and reason to advocate for partnerships at the beginning is that um, when working with a partner, a partner can tell you, um, given their experience in the field on and, um, and having a, a demographic of folks that um, make up people that are affected by any experience, and in this case, the criminal justice system, um, they can tell you um, where the need is among folks so that we're not creating things that um, isn't necessarily filling kind of a need um, that is really sought after by the folks that um, are um, looking to work through um, the impact of being affected by the um, criminal justice system. Um, and then um, also um, one other suggestion, suggestion is advocacy organizations, local advocacy organizations. So um, when you have built something in partnership um, with um, folks that are experiencing um, the issue that you're looking to solve, advocacy organizations are also good ways of, of getting the tool that you've built out there. Um, I will go on to the next questions. Um, there's a few things in the chat. Um, Chanel, you have your hand raised and then I'll, I'll read through the chat so we can lift up the other questions. Um, so let me unmute you. Okay. All right, first I would like to thank you all for the Oops. Sorry, I, I think that was my fault. Chanel, can we start again? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I was just saying that, first of all, thank you guys for doing this. Um, I am the founder of the Clean Slate Expungement Program here in the city of Milwaukee and trying to work my way throughout the rest of the state in Wisconsin. And so I just wanted to ask, actually I have a couple of questions, but I, so I hope I don't forget. So my first question is when it comes to um, partnering organizations, what what are you what what organizations are you looking to partner with are you looking to partner with organizations that provide advocacy or activity because what happens here in the state of Wisconsin and I would imagine it happen in other states is um you know so you have these legal aid societies right and then you also have many states that have clean slate programs right so what happened is the legal aid society is the well-funded organization right so but in the in the in the process of being well-funded if they're getting any federal funding or even sometimes state funding some of that funding prohibits them from doing policy work so, you know a lot of times they have a gag order on them to where they can they they may be seeing a lot of people but and they may have a lot of the real-time data but at the same time, they are not able to advocate or introduce legislation or introduce any policy just because that's the way some funding is cut out. And so what happens is you have the clean slate programs such as myself that do not have those restrictions, however, because I don't have the funding either. So I just wanted to point that out that it's a kind of a catch 22 when it comes to um, partnering or just looking to partner with um, some, you know, some organizations that, like I said, like the legal actions, the legal aid, they are the more funded programs here that here in Wisconsin, they just came around, you know, they've had expungement programs for probably a little bit over a decade and a half, but they were not servicing the uh, black and brown communities here in the state. But now that there's a lot of funding, now they are, and it pushed the clean slates over to the side um, so I just wanted to know, like, when you're looking for um, partners, what exactly are you looking for in partnerships? Um, and do you separate the activity service providers? We just so happen to be both. We provide activities and advocacy. We actually have our own legislation that we've been working on for the last eight years um, since the, since the um, start of Clean Slate. So I was just, that's what I wanted to ask. And to your point about um, being able to petition the court, the state of Wisconsin is, I don't know if any other states operate like this, but there's 
they, they we can never have automatic expungement because there's sentencing, there's conditions to every sentence. And so I know we can probably talk side, you know, like do like a sidebar, or, you know, offline conversation about that because you know it gets really technical like so for example you have to do community service you have to do an AODA program or whatever get your high school diploma in order to even receive your expungement that has to be set up at the time of sentencing and I know that's something that's new unique as far as I know to Wisconsin that would not allow automatic expungement um, we have gotten some work done to where they did an automatic expungement of dismissed cases or cases that were never prosecuted. Um, but it's going to be a really, you know, it's going to be a, an issue trying to get automatic expungement, you know, um, because every sentence is different. You know, every person's um, conditions of their sentence is different and you have to meet all the conditions in order to be to get your expungement and the DOC it has to sign off on it so it's a lot of steps and technicalities even if you're qualified to have your record expungement which is expunged which is a whole nother issue in itself yeah yeah thank you Chanel um I think there's a couple of questions in in that which we can address so the first would be around um, kind of what is an ideal partner for maybe a brigade. Um, and I think really any partner within this within the space um, is is a partnership that um, brigades would be seeking in order to at least um, work together to better understand this issues and, and look at, at a local level and look towards solutions. Um, there are some restrictions around um, what brigades can do um, as part of um, their nonprofit status. Um, and so there is that question that comes up. Um, there's a, a brigade in Milwaukee that I don't know if you've been connected to, um, but we can definitely follow up um, offline and, and make sure that that connection happens. Um, and then um, it seems like there were some questions around the specific um, statutes in Wisconsin that I think would be well suited for office hours. Um, David and Matt, do you have any follow up from that? Uh, yeah, yeah. And in terms of like statewide policy changes, um, you know, that's probably that's outside the scope of like what an individual or a small group of people can do. That's like a coalition. That's got to be a coalition effort um, at the state level. Uh, you know, the states that have been able to pull off automatic record clearance, it's, it's a long process and it involves a lot of different players and actors, mostly, you know, local folks who are impacted by the system, but then also sometimes the Code for America folks can play a role in, you know, consulting with the state and reassuring them that yes, there are these technical barriers, but we can work through these things or we can design a policy that works around these things and we don't have to just work through what's already blocking people in the first place. But it's a it's its own it's its own uh, can of worms. Um, and so it might be outside of the scope of like what an individual brigade can do with a small set of partnerships. Great. Um, well, I want to be mindful of the fact that we are at time. There's a couple questions here in the chat that um, are actually really great questions. Um, so what I think that we can do is look to address these questions at the beginning of our next session um, before we kind of get started. Um, so we have live answers for that. Um, and then um, and then continue this conversation next week. So um, as was mentioned, we are scheduled to meet again um, at the same time on the same day next week. There is a new link and password. So please make sure you check your email to get into the, um, into the next session. I um, really appreciate everybody's um, participation here. Um, Matt and David, thank you so much for your time um, and this really tangible um, presentation um, that we've been able to walk through together. Um, this has been great. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we will have a video of this recording as well as slides available um, from this session um, and we'll send that out by email. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us um, and it was great to see some new faces as well um, here today and um, we will be talking to you soon. Um, thanks so much and have a great evening.
Take care, everyone. Have a good night.